on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Now, coming up this afternoon, strife for Sakir Starmer. The Labour leader sees the biggest rebellion of his leadership after 10 of his front benches were among 56 Labour MPs voting for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Downing Street uh, defiance over Rwanda as Rishi Sunak promises emergency legislation to ensure his asylum policy is not blocked again after the Supreme Court ruled it unlawful. And a pro-Palestine protest in London sparks a furious backlash after activists scaled one of Britain's most hallowed war memorials last night, while police officers appeared to just stand by and watch. Yeah, all of that coming up, but first let's get to the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Alex. Good afternoon. Labour Shadow Defence Secretary says Sir Keir Starmer was right to be firm following a major rebellion within the party over his stance on the Gaza conflict. 56 of his MPs backed an SNP motion calling for a ceasefire in the region, despite the Labour leader only supporting pauses in the fighting. Ten shadow ministers, including Jess Phillips, have now resigned since the war began. Dr Amal Latif, an independent councillor who resigned over Starmer's stance on the ceasefire told Talk TV a humanitarian pause is naive. And in the meantime, his shadow front bench were um, having national uh, interviews on TV suggesting that actually uh, they would support a siege on Gaza in certain circumstances. And I couldn't, right. in good conscience, belong to a party that had such, where the national leadership had such disregard for uh, human life and international law. Um, so that was the reason I resigned initially. Um, and uh, we, I did have an early call for a ceasefire. Um, I think the call for a humanitarian pause is very misguided, actually. The US president says he is mildly hopeful there will be a deal to free more than 200 Israeli hostages in Gaza. Overnight, Joe Biden told a media conference in California that he didn't want to speak prematurely, but that the US had seen great cooperation from Qatar, which has been leading the ongoing negotiations between Israel and Hamas. The new Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, has made his first working visit to Ukraine. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has thanked the UK for support and says they had a good meeting focused on weapons for the front line, strengthening air defence and protecting their people and critical infrastructure. What I want to say by being here is that we will continue to give you the moral support, the diplomatic support, the economic support, but above all the military support that you need, not just this year and next year, but for however long it takes. The new Home Secretary has insisted that Rwanda is a safe destination for asylum seekers to be deported, despite the Supreme Court ruling the policy is unlawful. James Cleverly says Number 10 is working on a new treaty to ensure the policy isn't blocked again. But Sun columnist Trevor Kavanagh has told Talk TV there's still many hurdles in the way. If you read the Daily Telegraph today, there's an article by an anonymous Home Office in which he spells out the fact which we all knew, but he does so in terms that basically nobody in the Home Office is prepared to allow the Tory government to deport anybody. So, I mean, it, it is a very interesting article because it is a systematic destruction of the whole argument of the blob uh, being prepared to go with the government of the day, the elected, democratically elected ministers... Ofwat is launching an investigation into Southeast Water over concerns of its reliability. The regulator said customers had been failed too often and was rated the worst performing for water supply interruptions. It comes after a string of incidents in which customers were left without water, including some for as long as 23 days. 
And the first four episodes of the final series of Netflix The Crown have been given mixed reviews from critics. Season six of the royal drama depicts the events of the late 1990s, leading up to the death of Diana in 1997 and the aftermath. In a one-star review, The Guardian said the Diana-obsessed series is the very definition of bad writing. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. The weather's looking a little mixed today. Areas of cloud, some clear spells and also quite a few showers. But early on, we've seen this rain crossing southernmost parts. That's actually Storm Frederico, so named by the French Met Office, uh, but not really any great impact for us. Instead, we're watching this area of showery rain pushing its way in from the west and making its way eastwards. And you can see where we've got that mishmash of clear spells, uh, cloud and also showery rain. Not warm up towards the north. Temperatures in uh, around two or three degrees Celsius down towards the south could see 10 or 11 and then through the course of the day that rain continues to push its way eastwards and again overnight pushing the cloud out of the way allowing skies to clear behind there will be a rash of showers though becoming focused on the northwest and pushing their way through the Cheshire Gap so a very cold night to come for the north of Scotland well below zero there at the risk of some ice on the roads and elsewhere we could see a touch of frost mist and fog likely around the dawn but that should clear quite readily and then it looks like being actually a really nice Stay on Friday. There'll be a few showers around, but nothing too much. And uh, then the cloud starts to build across parts of uh, Southern Ireland and the southwest as the next area of wet and windy weather comes in. Temperatures for many in single figures, so it's not warm. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. Lots coming up over the next few hours, including some hard-hitting footage from the Gaza front line and more rumours about that royal rift. Is there a truce or isn't there after that birthday phone call? Well, I'll tell you what... I think uh, there probably isn't. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, my, my most interesting fact from yesterday was discovering that the king does not have a mobile phone. Yeah, but we just decided, didn't we? It's because his fingers are too fat yeah. to text. <laughs> Well, he could get... He's the king. He could get a special phone with huge keyboards oh, yeah, exactly. or something. Who needs, who needs a mobile phone when you've got courtiers with, like, various, you know... Courtiers. 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 Yeah. Um, anyway, we've got a hell of a show ahead of us. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, turbulent mm. news agenda is really... Uh, Extraordinary, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's one minute it's the Conservative Party falling apart. Today is the turn of Labour. They're both falling and apart. And you just think, you know, whoever the next government's going to be, are just going to be as divided and fractious as, as we've already seen over the past few years, which isn't great for us, is it? Yeah, Keir's got a massive rebellion. Uh, Rishi's got a massive rebellion. Rebellions are the order of the day, aren't they? And on top of that, the civil service can't be bothered turning up to work. That's what we've found out. They've been told they've got to be in now at least 60% of the time. Which is the Home Office, so Mike... Mark Rycroft, who's a sort of Whitehall Mandarin, has informed uh, Home Office staff, uh, right, I've had enough of this work, but right, as of next year, you lot, I want you in the office for 60% of the time. No, Mark, say 100%. It's yeah. unbelievable. We don't want the Home Office in your Home Office. Yeah, so what, they're getting tough and saying... <laughs> that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, they're getting tough and saying you've got to come in uh, for three days a week. Uh, we should try imagine? that. I think, yeah, I, we I should could sit on my that. sofa in my cat print pyjamas. Yeah, exactly. You know, my exactly. mug of cocoa. Yeah, sounds good to me. Living my best life. Sounds good to me. Uh, now, uh, we are asking today, is Sir, Sir Keir Starmer right to stick to his guns on the issue of a ceasefire? And we'd love to hear from you. So uh, give us a call on 0344 499 1000 or text us, uh, write talk in your message and send it to 87222 or tweet us on x at Talk TV. Uh, shall we get straight into our top story Let's right away? Uh, and in a major blow to Keir Starmer, 56 well Labour MPs defied well the party leader last night to vote for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, Ten of Labour's front benches, including Jess Phillips, Afsal Khan and Yasmin Qureshi, even quit their roles yesterday mm -hmm. in order to back the motion introduced by the Scottish National Party. 
And there are fears that the rebellion could spread even further, doing major damage to the party's election hopes. A Savannah poll published today suggested almost half of Muslim Labour supporters from 2019 said Starmer's handling of the Middle East conflict made them feel more negatively towards the party. Uh, with us uh, in the studio for the next hour is The Sun's excellent political columnist, uh, Trevor Kavanagh. Uh, welcome, Trevor. Uh, well, as we were just saying, both party leaders having an absolute nightmare this week. But uh, the Keir Starmer, the rebellion against him, is pretty significant. I would have thought a few more of these uh, shadow cabinet ministers might have gone along with what he wanted, but they won't. Well, at any other, <clears throat> at any other time, this would be the story of the week, yes, wouldn't it? Yeah. And... Uh, all eyes will be focused on Labour and its problems, which are going to be ongoing right through to the point when they eventually win the election and after. But, you know, the whole publicity issue has been mopped up by the Tories because, as ever, they're at war with each other and making mistakes and uh, being uh, second-guessed by an unelected Supreme Court. I mean, how dangerous do you think this sort of disunity is, given that a lot of people expect the Labour Party to form the next government, on Britain's influence on the world stage? Is it nothing? Is it just something that we all get swept up in as journalists and Westminster watchers? Or is it something that other countries look at and think, oh, there's weakness there, the tail is wagging the dog? Well, I think that the, uh, the Muslim vote is very important to the Labour Party and it's been cultivated as such. It's one of the reasons why I think we've had the open door immigration policy. These are seen as uh, reliable Labour votes. But suddenly they're not so reliable. And uh, there, are, there is a lot of anger out there. We're going to face another really serious weekend of protests with demos, about 150 of them all over the country. I mean, they're bringing the capital city to a halt every weekend now. And uh, they will, I think, re reflect this in their votes at the election. But at the moment, when you're 20, 25, maybe 30% ahead in the polls, you've got a lot of slack to play with here. Yeah. The Tories are not in any position to fight back. Yeah. But that's and they, they, they don't want a ceasefire either, so they're not going to move yeah. to the Tories. But that's the thing, isn't it? <coughs> what Keir has calculated here, uh, just as... Well, Rishi Sunak seems to have given up with the Red Wall, but in the past he's tried to appeal to them. That's the Tory... Uh, line and uh, of course Keir Starmer's job is to appeal to the blue wall uh, and hence I think uh, his firm stance on cease on no ceasefire uh, but uh, his calculation as you say before we get lost in wonder about him suddenly finding a backbone and standing up for what he believes uh, he has calculated he can lose five percent maybe even more in the popularity polls and still win the election. And these 10 highly principled uh, shadow cabinet ministers who have quit on moral grounds, uh, no doubt all represent heavily Muslim constituencies. So welcome to Westminster, where it's basically <laughs> a numbers game, isn't it? It is, and I think you've made the point there, which is absolutely right, that this will reflect well on Keir Starmer. It will show that he's prepared to stand up for the right thing. I mean, he's stood up for the right thing in the past, even though he's been uh, having directly opposite uh, views only a short time earlier. He's a man of somersaults and U-turns yeah. throughout his rise from uh, a left-wing lawyer to the leader of the Labour Party. So, but nonetheless, this will go down well in Europe, in the West, in America and elsewhere, where everyone is saying that you can't have a ceasefire while there are still hostages in Gaza. So he's being prime ministerial. In he's being statesmanlike. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but can that hold? I mean, we've had a long history now of the UK being relatively interventionist, <laughs> being a very strong ally to America, being almost, you know, playing that role of the West being the police for democracy and peace in the world. Could that now come to an end when you look at these sorts of splits in the Labour Party and changing voter demographics? Well, I'm not sure that the bulk of the British population is in support of the Palestinian flag wavers. And I think that um, as long as Hamas insists on holding those uh, hostages, um, all the sympathy for those uh, children who are being killed inadvertently in the process of the Israeli uh, attack on uh, Hamas in Gaza, that will have to go by the board as long as the hostages are still held. And there's no way that the Hamas leaders are going to take part in a ceasefire anyway. So, I mean, the whole thing is purely academic.
Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? People keep saying, oh, uh, why doesn't Israel call a ceasefire? Why doesn't it ceasefire? They neglect uh, to reflect on the fact that uh, the, uh, their opponents, their enemies, Hamas, don't want a ceasefire either. So you've got two sides of a war, don't want a ceasefire. So hence, this international call for a ceasefire is, as I keep saying, the kind of the global debating society that makes no difference to reality. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, let's see what Jonathan List thinks. He's a political commentator and deputy director of the pro-EU think tank British Influence. Jonathan, thanks for coming on the programme. We were just discussing there that however much people might grandstand and proselytise about the benefits of a ceasefire and civilians uh, being killed in, well, multiple numbers uh, over in Gaza, that both sides don't want it. Well, obviously, both sides want different things. Israel wants an end to Hamas. Um, Hamas you know, it wants an end to Israel, let's face it. Um, but you have, you know, the, the, the central bargaining chip is obviously the hostages. That will obviously form a part of any ceasefire negotiation. Clearly, everyone wants a ceasefire. The question is how we get there. And as I think Kevin said, this is a bit of a, it, in some ways, it's a debating society topic because whatever the Labour Party says will not have any impact on the ground. But on the other hand, it could hardly be more important because it's a matter of such principle. And MPs report that they received more letters from their constituencies and emails than on any other topic in this parliament almost. And so it really matters to a lot of people, even people who are not personally impacted by events in either Israel or Gaza. So it's a real question of principle of, of what we think should happen about how much we value people's lives. This is important. And so Starmer, to my mind, has been politically very foolish because he tried to show strength by increasing and by imposing this new strand of discipline on his party over this issue. Whereas in the first few weeks of the conflict, he allowed front benches to come out quite strongly and say they supported a ceasefire without any kind of pushback from the Labour leadership. But now anyone who wants to make that case and in particular vote for it has to resign, effectively be sacked, as we saw last night. He didn't have to do that because now he's turned it into a conversation about his leadership. He's turned it into a conversation about Labour divisions, taking away headlines from the Tory catastrophe over Rwanda. And importantly, it's stupid in the long run because he will have to argue for the position he's currently fired people for because there will come a time in the next few days or weeks when Joe Biden himself will demand a ceasefire when the numbers of casualties simply gets too great and then Stan will have to argue for that position himself. Also, Jonathan, it seems to me, you know, if Starmer is the prime minister in the making and his shadow <laughs> cabinet was coming along for the ride, obviously, you know, you don't pick a shadow chat cabinet lightly. These are the people that he thinks are the most talented uh, to, be, to be a government. He's just lost 10 of them. I mean, that's catastrophic, isn't it? I think that could be overstated. He hasn't lost any shadow cabinet ministers. They've all been in more junior positions. And also, people can leave the front well, bench and then 10. come back into it 10. quietly a few months later. He's lost 10 cabinet, shadow cabinet ministers. So no, they're not shadow cabinet. They're junior ministerial positions. He hasn't lost the shadow, you know, chance of the shadow, you know, international development secretary. These are junior positions he's lost. And I'm sure that, you know, even the Labour Party, even though the Labour Party is decimated at the last election, there are still enough MPs to fill those positions. And as I said, I would not be at all surprised if many of those, if not most of those people are back in the shadow front bench within a few months, having made their point, as is entirely their right to do so. I mean, you say that you think Sakir Stam is being pretty politically sanguine here. I would want to put to you the opposite, that the UK has received significant intelligence about quite who might be connected to some of these protesters and how this conflict in the Middle East is in increasingly an information war, frankly, across the world. Surely, by Starmer giving in to rabble-rousers on the street, some of whom may have unsavoury contacts, he's essentially allowing um, people to dictate Western geopolitical strategy by creating havoc on our streets. I don't think that'd be sanguine at all. He said anything about listening to rabble-rousers, Alex. This is about, you know, this is not a niche stop the war left-wing fringe opinion that there should be a ceasefire it's a position it's a position that's been adopted by that left-wing hero emmanuel macron 
you know, who's no stranger to some conflict in faraway lands. And so this is a, a position that people have reached in good faith, just as pe people have reached a position on the other side, I assume in good faith in the vast majority of cases. Everyone wants to see peace. Everyone wants to see a negotiated settlement in the long run because this is unsustainable. It's simply a question of how we get there and at what point we say this many Palestinian people killed is too many. 5,000, 4,500 Palestinian children is not a price that we are prepared to pay. The question is, at what point does the international community coalesce and make that argument? But as we were just discussing, Jonathan, uh, uh, with Trevor Kavanagh, I mean, the thing is, you've got the international community, as they call it, countries all over the uh, world, people all over the world, calling for a ceasefire. You have two combatants in a war, you know, th in this case, Hamas and Israel. Neither of them want a ceasefire. So it's sort of academic, isn't it, calling for a ceasefire? So uh, Starmer uh, has sort of caused himself all sorts of trouble on something that is pretty meaningless in the end. There isn't going to be a ceasefire, end of, unless Hamas suddenly released all of the, stat all, all of the hostages. Well, I did read a report recently that actually Netanyahu was offered um, some of the, the hostages in return for a five-day ceasefire, and he turned that down. So, you know, I think that we have to also separate the different actors in this. Netanyahu is not a good faith actor. Even people, you know, in the Israeli Knesset um, don't trust his motives and all this. And so there are going to be decisions that are made out of personal interest. And I think we also have to make the point that the hostages, their families are some of the the most forceful uh, proponents of a ceasefire in many cases because they want their loved ones, understandably, to be bombed by Israeli planes in Gaza where their loved ones are being held. And, and actually, they feel as though they've been neglected by the Israeli government that has sort of, in a way, thrown them to the wolves and said, you know, they're expendable in, in pursuing this particular war. So, of course, the, the fundamental point is that Israel is not a completely isolated actor. It depends on its friends and allies in the world particularly the United States, uh, which has obviously been supplying it with arms and money for a very long time. So if Joe Biden says to Netanyahu, this has to end, and Netanyahu defies him, the options for Netanyahu are going to become very limited. And the other point to remember is that Israel has been busy forging alliances with countries in its neighborhood that it didn't have relations with before, and in pursuing the war in the way it has, where it's driven out those people, driven them away, not sought alliances and friendships, in what could have been a group shared task in eliminating Hamas, who is certainly not liked by the Saudis, the Jordanians, etc. But instead, it's forged this path on its own and driven those people away. And it will, in the end, need to make alliances yeah. with its neighbours and not drive away the people who, who fund it, in so many ways, the United States. And there will be no ceasefire. But thanks very much, Jonathan uh, Liss. Uh, uh, that's it, isn't it, Trevor? The truth is, there's no chance of a ceasefire whatsoever. So you've got uh, Starmer tying himself up in knots over an academic issue. Uh, you've got people like Macron, various nations, various do-gooders saying, oh, there's got to be a ceasefire, save the children. Uh, you know, and I understand that standpoint. No one wants to see innocent uh, civilians being killed in Gaza. But it's just not going to happen, is it, this ceasefire? Well, not until Joe Biden decides it's going to happen. <clears throat> and when it does, Keir Starmer will slip effortlessly in behind him. I mean, you have to remember that Keir Starmer's natural sympathies almost certainly are with the Palestinians, uh, in the same way as Jeremy Corbyn's were with Hamas and Hezbollah, but perhaps in a slightly more diluted way. He has appeared publicly on a Palestine... Uh, uh, solidarity campaign platform in Camden when he was uh, trying to become an MP. And so his sympathies, I think, would be in the direction that uh, Jonathan has been spelling out here. It's just He's just waiting for the opportunity to do one of his famous U-turns. I mean, one would think that he is privy <coughs> to some of the briefings the government gets from UK intelligence and people, you know, who aren't elected or are largely ghosts who work in security services and the like, explaining what's going on on the ground and what the bigger picture at play might be. Because, I mean, it, a lot of people who look at geopolitics know that there is, you know, wheels within wheels. There's a hand of Iran in all of this. There is, you know, uh, sheer Sunni battles trying to bust up, as Jonathan was saying, this accord that had happened between Israel and its neighbours and that you would imagine Starmer's being told, as is the government, well, look, this is what's going to make the world a safer place. Indeed. And one thing that keeps them all together is the fact that none of them on any side wants this to spread to a wider conflict. 
including uh, Iran at this point, who Just interestingly in, in, yeah. have said that they will not be backing Hamas mm. because they weren't told about the October 7th mm. uh, uh, attack. But you're absolutely right that Keir Starmer will have been kept assiduously in touch with whatever's happening because the Maybe government's interest is in keeping him on board on this. So he will have access to all of the information. And there is a lot going on. I mean, um, the reason that David Cameron was uh, brought back into the job as foreign secretary, one of the reasons is that he is seen as having very good contacts in the Middle East and that there is hope, perhaps vain, but still hope that the Abraham Accords could still be resuscitated at some point in the future. So, I mean, whether this will happen or not is maybe, a, a, just as I say, optimistic, but that's the reason. What are his contacts like, David Cameron? What are his contacts like in Libya? Because they, Libya owes him a yeah. huge... <laughs> and Syria, of course, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. He can always ask his friends in China. <laughs> well. Trevor will be staying with us, by the way, for the rest of this hour. <clears throat> so uh, we'll look forward to talking to you some more. Now, your texts and tweets have been coming in this lunchtime. We asked, is Sir Keir Starmer right to stick to his guns on the issue of a ceasefire? John says, yes. Keep foreign affairs out of British politics 100%. Greg writes, post-election Starmer will have to deal with Israel if he is elected, like it or not. Hamas are a terrorist group who are more than happy to use 2.3 million people as human shields, while some of the Israeli politicians would quite like to help them in that goal. And Jez has tweeted, of course, he is wanting a conditional ceasefire, which would be acceptable to at least one party, rather than an immediate one, which neither Israel nor Hamas has indicated it wants. Now, coming up after the break. After the Supreme Court declared the Rwanda plan unlawful yesterday, Rishi Sunak says he will do whatever is necessary to get those flights off the ground. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. <laughs> ah! Me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. But, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am fans. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted Newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yes. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the Prime Minister says he will introduce emergency legislation to get Rwanda deportation flights off the ground in a direct challenge to the Supreme Court's ruling that the scheme is unlawful. At a press conference yesterday afternoon, Sunak vowed he would not let foreign courts stand in the way of his migrant policy we will take the extraordinary step of introducing emergency legislation. This will enable Parliament to confirm that with our new treaty, Rwanda is safe. I will not allow a foreign court to block these flights. If the Strasbourg court chooses to intervene against the expressed wishes of Parliament, I am prepared to do what is necessary to get flights off. Meanwhile, Conservative Deputy Chairman Lee Anderson went as far as to say the Prime Minister should just ignore the Supreme Court ruling and fly migrants to Rwanda right now. Uh, the Sun's political columnist Trevor Kavanagh is still with us. Uh, now, part of uh, Rishi's uh, declaration of intent here is that uh, the Supreme Court has decided that Rwanda is a bit dodgy. First of all, they don't trust Rwanda not to repatriate our migrants to their own home countries where they may face persecution. And secondly, uh, there's a question mark, according to the Supreme Court, over human rights in Rwanda. Uh, so that's their decision. Whether or not, Whatever you think about this Supreme Court, it has been sitting in judgment on this for a long, long time. That is its uh, venerable decision. Uh, Rishi Sunak stands up yesterday in front of that lectern, incredibly, by the way, with stop the boats on the front of it. No, you didn't. No, you're not. Uh, but he stands up and says, well, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to pass a, uh, a, an act. We're going to pass a law saying that Rwanda is perfectly safe. That's just sort of clown-like circus nonsense, isn't it? How, you, you know, what, what next? They're going to pass a law saying Chechnya is safe. Somalia, go and have your holiday there. Why don't you go to Myanmar? Because the British government has passed an act saying they're safe. This is just absurd. Yes, I must admit that uh, I've been under the impression um, that once the Prime Minister says basically he's staking everything on stopping the boats, as he did as soon as he became Prime Minister a year ago, that he would do everything possible to make sure he stopped the boats. And that the boats would stop. Because if he didn't, then the vote, he might as well call the election straight away and not bother to contest it. That's a promise that the British public took very, very seriously. Yes. Certainly I did, and I hate to think of myself to be discover I'm a gullible fool. And voters will feel the same way. If, if, these, um, if these illegal immigrants are not sent back at some point in the next 12 months, the sooner the better, then they... They might as well give up. And I think that um, I think that pigs will fly before they do. <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> yeah right. as opposed to the, f the flights with the <clears throat> migrants well, on them, yeah. Let's try and figure out if those boats can be stopped and quite how that would happen by speaking to Martin Howe Casey, who is a member of the ERG Legal Advisory Group. Martin, I get the impression, when I've looked at this, when they, the policy was first announced about two years ago, I said, that ain't going to happen. I get the impression it was a bit of a back-of-the-fag packet policy, rushed out to make good headlines without any of the legalese being put in place to make it work. Can it work? Well, it, it, it can be made to work. And, well, it could have been made to work um, if, as you say, the legalese had been dealt with. The fundamental problem... Uh, is that because of a, a, a load of uh, very um, adventurous decisions by the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg, questions which uh, in the past would have been regarded as foreign relations questions for the government to decide, you know, whether or not a foreign country is or not safe for people, uh, end up being decided by our domestic courts. Now, that's compounded by the fact that the real party in this litigation in our courts was a foreign body, the UN uh, 
human uh, UN, UN Ref, High Commissioner for Refugees Agency. Um, and this should never, in my view, have been a matter litigated in our courts. And the opportunity to deal with it was when the illegal migration bill, you know, otherwise known as the small bill, boats bill, was going through Parliament. Um, the, the government didn't, they copped out, basically. It did not put in a, a clause which would have ousted um, the Human Rights Act from affecting, uh, uh, affecting removal decisions uh, under that bill. Um, it left it open to challenge, um, completely negligently, in my view. I mean, I mean, not only was it obvious it needed to be done, but there was actually a backbench amendment which was put forward by uh, Sir Bill Cash, um, which would have been effective. They failed to do that. Uh, uh, apparently, from um, the Home Secretary's resignation letter, directly a decision by the Prime Minister uh, against her wishes. Uh, and now, um, today, we have him saying, oh, well, he introduced emergency legislation, which will do whatever's necessary. Well, let's see what the legislation is. Uh, will it actually be effective? It can be effective, it's properly drafted. Uh, I have severe question mark over whether it will act, whether they will actually do that. And if it is effective, they now have a serious problem in getting it through the House of Lords, uh, because they're timed out under the Parliament Act for, for the Commons to override the Lords. Uh, Martin, what is the point of the government, Rishi and the gang, deferring to the Supreme Court, saying we're waiting for the Supreme Court's decision on whether or not the Rwanda scheme is lawful or unlawful? The Supreme Court then decides it's unlawful. So the Prime Minister says, right, uh, I'm going to have a vote which will reverse, effectively, what the Supreme Court has decided. They have said Rwanda's not a safe place. Right, we'll pass an Act of Parliament saying it is a, a safe place. What is the point yeah, of that? I, I mean, the question of whether it's a safe place or not, uh, it's, it's not a black and white question. It, it amounts evaluation yeah. of the future intentions of particularly the government of Rwanda and evaluation of, uh, of, of levels of risk. So it's, it's not a black and white question. Uh, I, I think it's classically a foreign relations issue, mm. which in the past would have been treated by the courts as a matter for the government to decide and on which the courts would have deferred to the government. Mm. Now, that has changed as a result of the Human Rights Act um, and the Strasbourg Court decisions to which that act gives effect in our law. So the, the government couldn't... Um, you know, without asking Parliament to change the law, the government couldn't have just sort of ignored the case and put people on planes going to Rwanda. Um, what, what it could have done and should have done is to have put forward uh, suitable clauses in the Illegal Migration Bill, which was meant to make the scheme work, <laughs> and it failed to do so. I think it is a shocking act of negligence by the government has led to this scenario... Um, they're now in a disastrous attempt to recover from a situation that their own incompetence has created. Martin, thank you ever so much for coming on the programme. I mean, negligence or willful, what do you think? Because it sounds to me here that Rishi Sunak was told by backbenchers, he was advised by other people, including his own Home Secretary, there is a way to make this work and it won't get blocked in the courts. And he sort of went, no. Mm. <coughs> well, Martin Howe, as ever, is the wise owl here. And I think that uh, I, he's right on most things. On this one, um, there is a, a strange question about how people, in, uh, judges, interpret the law, because obviously the High Court judges, who are estimable justices, uh, well qualified, decided that it was perfectly legal. The Appeal Court changed the, the, the verdict on that, and then the Supreme Court reinforced it. But the United Nations, which they keep citing as being the arbiter in all of these matters, has used Rwanda for its own purposes yeah. to send refugees. Uh, Denmark, Germany, Italy and others uh, want to send, um, uh, want to send uh, illegal immigrants to Rwanda or somewhere similar. So this is something which elected governments are considering and wanting to do and being overruled by supernumerary uh, bodies who uh, somehow decide that they have the right to interpret a law and nobody else does. 
And uh, would it not help <clears throat> if we finally got round to doing what Suella Braverman and many other uh, Tories, many other people in this country want? Uh, let's leave the European Convention on Human Rights so at least we can start to dictate our own policies like the Rwanda scheme. Uh, that would be a, a step forward, would it not? It sounds sensible, doesn't it? But the, the, <laughs> the big problem with the EHCR is that uh, it is tangled up with all sorts of other fairly important things, not least the Northern Ireland Protocol, mm. the Good Friday Agreement. Is in, it is actually interpreted on the basis of us being uh, bound by the European Convention. So, you know, human rights and, and, and so on now rule politicians, elected, democratically elected politicians. And this is all thanks very much to Tony Blair and the Labour government that introduced the uh, human rights laws without listening to all of those who raised exactly the sort of objections that justify the position we're in today. By the way, uh, of course, we <coughs> also blame Tony Blair and his acolytes for the very existence of the Supreme Court, which I don't think we even need. We certainly don't. Yeah, we've got ourselves into a whole Gordian knot it's... of rubbish, haven't we? Did you Legal... call it lawfare? Go lawfare. lawfare. A Gordian Indeed. knot of lawfare. Yeah. We're in a mess. Uh, Trevor is going to be staying with us, uh, but right now we have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime. We asked, is Sir Keir Starmer right to stick to his guns on the issue of a ceasefire? Len says, yes, but you need both sides to agree. Harry writes, on this, yes. At least he has some morals. Uh, Lee has tweeted, totally. I've gained more respect for him because of his stance. He needs to toughen up and get rid of the appeaser Labat Cabal. Uh, but Sue says uh, he is an unprincipled man with no backbone who supports war crimes and bullies. Ooh, well, coming up after the break, pro-Palestine protesters scale Hyde Park War Memorial as police stand by and do nothing. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the Met have apologised for not being able to respond quickly enough when pro-Palestinian protesters scaled a war memorial following Parliament's vote against a ceasefire in Gaza last night. Footage shows, uh, as you can see, flag-waving protesters climbing on the Royal Artillery Memorial at Hyde Park Corner, which was covered with poppy reeds from Remembrance Weekend. But Met Police Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley says there wasn't anything illegal happening. It is, it is not illegal to climb onto a statue. I think that might be something that um, government may, may consider. Um, but that's for them to decide, not for me. Um, the officer recognised that whilst it wasn't illegal, it was sort of, um, it, it was unfortunately inflammatory in certain ways. The officers at the scene asked them to get down and they did. Uh, still with us in the studio now is The Sun's political columnist, uh, Trevor Kavanagh. Uh, Trevor, the, we're also going to show you some uh, footage in a little while of uh, a Palestine mob uh, trying to attack the Cenotaph last night. So two of our most sacred war memorials last night were kind of under assault uh, from more pro-Palestinian protesters. And all we ever get from the police, this is what we got every weekend, is we're, ju we're just looking for clarification on the law. Uh, you and I were just talking to well-known former copper Pete Blexley, Peter Blexley, who just said, look, if a copper suspects that the law may be being broken, that there could be a breach of uh, peace here, they can arrest. The, the, the police just don't seem to want to arrest these people who are attacking our sacred war memorials. What the hell is going on? But the interesting thing about uh, Sir Mark Rowley's uh, comments there is that he actually gave the justification for an arrest, which was that this was inflammatory, in his words. Yeah. Inflammatory, surely, is sufficient for a breach of the peace offence. Yeah. And a breach of the peace can be ideal for a quick action by police to deal with an incident on the ground without any need for other resources. You have to ask yourself how quickly the police would have acted if, instead of a Palestinian flag, someone had been waving the Union Jack. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it seems <clears throat> to me that um, this is a very newfangled thing with the police. I don't think I've ever heard the head of the police before saying, oh, well, we don't know what the law is, or there's no law that exists that enables us to act. I mean, it, do, do you think the same? Is this some sort of recent development that's entered policing? Yes, I'm afraid that in that short clip you've already shown, um, they have vindicated everything that uh, Suella Braverman levelled at them in that article in The Times, that they are partisan, that they are deliberately soft-peddling against particularly any, uh, any large numbers or from a political uh, vantage point. So when it comes to Palestinians, they can do almost as they please and are only arrested if there's uh, photographic evidence which can be pursued subsequently. When it comes to the EDL thugs, they're on to them straight away. In fact, they meet them halfway before they've even got beyond Hyde Park. Yeah. So there, is, there are two uh, sides to this story, and Mark Rowley is on, clearly on one of them. I think it was uh, maybe last weekend, one weekend before, but there's been an absolute <coughs> handful of arrests of pro-Palestinian marches. They, they, one weekend, about 100,000 marched through uh, London, nine arrests. Last weekend, and we're not in any way supporting the EDL or anything like that, but they turn up, 126 arrests. <laughs> I mean, there it is. There is a kind of favouritism. Of course. Yeah, well, joining us too is uh, Andy No, who took some of that video, I think, of the protesters on the war memorials. I mean, you were an eyewitness. You've been very active, actually, going down to the protest, seeing what's going on, documenting it, and, uh, frankly, giving the world an eye on what's happening. What sort of things have you been witnessing? Um, I, d I do observe what appears to be different types of policing responses, depending on who is there to demonstrate uh, so the, the announcement to surround the, the parliament was made through flyers, um, but still when people came, they were able to shut down the streets uh, where uh, in Westminster where the drivers were. And then as soon as they were done, then they were allowed, um, escorted by police uh, throughout central London, uh, where then they went on to confront some drivers. Uh, I witnessed somebody hitting a car, uh, throwing items at people, an elderly couple within a car and um, shutting down the iconic streets in, in central London and then climbing on this police 
uh, I, I, uh, excuse me, this war memorial. So you saw, uh, you, you also, I think, filmed uh, some people around the cenotaph. Let's have a look at some of your uh, brilliantly filmed footage. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Andy, uh, there they are all trying to attack the cenotaph. The police, in fairness, uh, at least uh, nominally trying to stop them. In other uh, scenes we've seen around the country, last night, in fact, uh, we saw coppers just sort of standing there watching people climb all these statues. Uh, quite extraordinary. And uh, I've been to three of these uh, demonstrations, and I must say... Uh, they're, they're full of hate for Israel, but they're not particularly menace, menacing uh, at the weekends. Yeah, 300,000 people on Saturday. I went to have a look at that. You don't feel frightened. Uh, but that looks a bit frightening around the cenotaph last night. Well, we, we have now more than a month of these protests that have been happening. And I, what I'm observing is they are becoming a bit more entrenched and mm -hmm. becoming essentially routine. It's happening not just on the weekends, but weekdays too. But... Some protesters are feeling emboldened to push um, a little bit further than what they could from the previous week or the week before. And uh, I think it's important to point out that not, not everybody there is um, aggressive or violent, um, but there are some people who are taking advantage of the anarchy that's been allowed to become routine in central London on some nights. You see, you see sorry, guys, I was just going to say, you've seen these protests, right? Uh, I've, I, as I say, I've taken the trouble to take a look at them myself. And the one thing uh, that is striking is there's a lot of free Palestine from the river to the sea. When will Palestine be free? Uh, a lot of uh, tremendous anti-Israel sentiment. But what you don't hear much of is ceasefire or release the hostages. And as you're indicating, Andy, uh, these protests are escalating, aren't they? We've got trouble here. The police have got to do something, wouldn't you say? So some of the chants that people are familiar with in English are, are the nicer ones, ones that in previous weeks where I've recorded that have been in Arabic have been explicitly anti-Semitic, where they don't mention Israelis, they mention specifically Yahud or Jews. Um, I did not observe that last night, but I have in previous weeks and mm -hmm. I've recorded it. Yeah, I mean, you've written extensively on divisions in society in America. You've written about Antifa. You've written about hardened sort of cause within activism and protest groups that have... I mean, when you look over at some of the videos coming from the States, it's even worse than here. You yeah. had, uh, you know, Muslim organisations screaming <laughs> dreadful things through loudspeakers, calling intifada and the like. Do you think that we're beginning to import <laughs> that sort of division in society here? Yes, and I witnessed it last night. There was there was a recycling of the BLM chants and slogans. Uh, if we don't get it, shut it down, which, and uh, no justice, no peace. So there's, um, they're using a playbook that was uh, very violent sub from several years ago in America and hoping to have it take root here and to grow and to radicalize people. Most of the people uh, on the streets last night in, at these demonstrations are young people youth and adolescents or young adults. I mean, Trevor, listening to that and also discussing for the fact that the police aren't acting on things, perhaps in an even-handed manner, and Andy suggesting that, you know, as weeks go by, people are becoming emboldened. Do you think it's about time government or the authorities stepped in and realised that if things aren't like caught hold of now, nipped in the bud, that we could be looking at an increasingly divided society. And that's frankly dangerous. It's very dangerous. And I think that the time has already passed when they should have stepped in. And one of the words that Andy used, which I think is absolutely appropriate here, is anarchy. The police have lost control. Uh, it's no, not a question of losing control. They have no control. And because they've shown no authority over these demonstrators, some of them uh, are Islamists and some of them are Hamas and uh, even the, the um, 
uh, gullible idiots who follow them in many cases, not all, I had to accept that many of them are appalled by the scenes of horror and violence in Israel, but they are being swept along with the Socialist Workers' Party, the Hamas um, political demonstrations. And the police are allowing this to happen and to escalate. And what we're going to see this weekend, allegedly, is 150 demonstrations across the whole of the country, which will paralyse the, the, the capital city and the major cities of this country. Interesting that uh, <coughs> you know, Extinction Rebellion are now getting involved. Uh, Greta Thunberg, <laughs> you know, their mask is slipping. Climate change yeah. is just a and mechanism Western. by which they protest mm. about absolutely everything. Uh, try to sum up, uh, just before you go, Trevor, it's great to have you on board. Thanks for being with us. Try to sum up the, the disgust that I think millions of Brits will feel about our sacred war memorials being abused like this. Well, I think this is a, a whole um, poisonous brew that's developing, and, and some of it's to do with immigration, because an awful lot of these protests are involving people not from Palestine, but from the Indian subcontinent. Mm. And many of them are Islamists, and all Islamists are Muslim, whether you like it or not. This is the problem that... Uh, the, Can I point the, out something I witnessed last night? Just want to say, the swathe of the British public at large are utterly disgusted with the scenes that are being played out on their television screens and in their streets and yep. their neighbourhoods every week now. We've got to wrap really soon, so, very quickly. So, so jumping on that, many, some of the chants, in addition to the political statements, were um, the Islamic faith creed being shouted on bull's horns mm -hmm. as well as Allahu Akbar. So there's a religious radicalising element in addition yeah. to yeah. the political class. Very worrying, very worrying. Both, thank you. We've run out of time, sadly. You, Coming up after the break, Labour disunity deepens after Starmer faced a major rebellion at the Gaza ceasefire vote last night. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. Me and you conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. But, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted Newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying <laughs> this <laughs> now. But Get right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. 
How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Cross Talk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and you are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. We are live with you from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up in the final hour of the show, Strife for Sakir Starmer. The Labour leader sees the biggest rebellion of his leadership after 10 of his front benches were among 56 Labour MPs voting for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Meanwhile, fears grow on the ground in the Middle East as violence spreads to the West Bank after Israeli forces foil an attack at a checkpoint on a road between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And is the Royal Rift rumbling on? After the birthday phone call from Harry to the King, a truce seemed to be on the cards. But now, there's fresh fury over claims that Prince William ignored his brother's phone calls at the, as the late Queen lay dying in Balmoral last year. Uh, all that coming up uh, in a little while, we'll go to the news. But, uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, Royal Rift, what do you make of it? It's never going to end, is it? I mean, if that was my brother who'd done all of that and had my useful li uh, idiot little author friend writing smeary books of allegation and supposition about my family's uh, private lives, especially during such a delicate time as the Queen was dying, then, yeah, I think I'd tell him not to, yeah. not to send me a Christmas card. Yeah, I, I love the bit about... Uh, oh, Harry was left... In the book, Scobie's book, it says, Harry was left all on his own. He's 40 years old. <laughs> Grow up. Uh, but a uh, lot still to come. But first, let's get the news headlines with Zora Solomon. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. Labour Shadow Defence Secretary Sakir Starmer was right to be firm following a major rebellion within the party over his stance on the Gaza conflict. 56 of his MPs backed an SNP motion calling for a ceasefire in the region, despite the Labour leader only supporting pauses in the fighting. While 10 shadow ministers, including Jess Phillips, have now resigned since the war began. Dr Amir Latif, an independent counsel who resigned over Starmer's stance on the ceasefire, told Talk TV a humanitarian pause is naive. And in the meantime, his shadow front bench were um, having national uh, interviews on TV suggesting that actually uh, they would support a siege on Gaza in certain circumstances. And I couldn't, right. in good conscience, belong to a party that had such, where the national leadership had such disregard for uh, human life and international law. Um, so that was the reason I resigned initially. Um, and uh, we, I did have an early call for a ceasefire. Um, I think the call for a humanitarian pause is very misguided, actually. The Foreign Secretary is promising to keep providing Ukraine with moral, diplomatic and, most importantly, military support. David Cameron has travelled to Kyiv for his first overseas visit, saying Britain will support Ukraine for however long it takes, while Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has thanked the UK for support. Home Secretary James Cleverley has defended emergency laws to revive plans to fly asylum seekers to Rwanda, as a former Supreme Court justice said the measures would be extraordinary. Lord Sumption said the move won't make any difference after the Supreme Court ruled the policy was unlawful. While well, Mr Cleverley disagreed with the criticism and said a new treaty with Rwanda would allow flights to depart. Martin Howe, an ERG legal advocate from the advocacy group, a member told Talk TV the government should have played it smarter, though. This should never, in my view, have been a matter litigated in our courts. And the opportunity to deal with it was when the illegal migration bill, you know, otherwise known as the Small bill, Boats Bill, was going through Parliament. Um, the, the government didn't, it copped out, basically. It did not put in a clause which would have ousted um, the Human Rights Act from affecting, uh, uh, affecting removal decisions. 
Police say a sixth body has been discovered at the scene of a house fire in West London. Three children are among the five people initially found dead at a property in Hounslow after the blaze on Sunday night. The deaths are currently being treated as unexplained. A 16-year-old boy who was arrested and bailed in connection with the felling of the Sycamore Gap tree will face no further action. Northumbria Police is investigating the attack on the landmark next to Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland and said the teenager had been released. Three men were arrested on suspicion of criminal damage and are on police bail. Officers say the tree was deliberately felled. And the first four episodes of the final series of Netflix The Crown have been given mixed reviews from critics. Season six of the royal drama depicts the events of the late 1990s, leading up to Diana's death in 1997 and the aftermath. In a one-star review, The Guardian said the Diana-obsessed series is the very definition of bad writing. Well, that's the latest. Now the weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. The weather's looking a little mixed today. Areas of cloud, some clear spells and also quite a few showers. But early on, we've seen this rain crossing southernmost parts. That's actually Storm Frederico, so named by the French Met Office, uh, but not really any great impact for us. Instead, we're watching this area of showery rain pushing its way in from the west and making its way eastwards. And you can see where we've got that mishmash of clear spells, uh, cloud and also showery rain. Not warm up towards the north. Temperatures in uh, around 2 or 3 degrees south. Celsius down towards the south could see 10 or 11 and then through the course of the day that rain continues to push its way eastwards and again overnight pushing the cloud out of the way allowing skies to clear behind there will be a rash of showers though becoming focused on the northwest and pushing their way through the Cheshire Gap so a very cold night to come for the north of Scotland well below zero there at the risk of some ice on the roads and elsewhere we could see a touch of frost mist and fog likely around the dawn but that should clear quite readily and then it looks like being actually a really nice day on Friday there'll be a few showers around but nothing too much and uh, then the cloud starts to build across parts of uh, Southern Ireland and the southwest as the next area of wet and windy weather comes in. Temperatures for many in single figures so it's not warm. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. Uh, lots coming up over the next hour. It and you know, is. <laughs> I think if viewers had the option of a red button they could press to see what we get up to and talk about during advert breaks and behind the scenes, they'd be amazed. You, you, they, Kev, they really Kev's don't want to know. You, you don't want to know. Trust me, folks. You don't want to know. <laughs> Oh. But, uh, yeah, as, as I say, what a day. What a, what a week. Uh, I, I mean, we've forgotten that this week began with the bombshell news that David Cameron was back. That, yeah, that by comparison, with what's happened since seems really dull. Yeah, I know, and it's, all, it's going to continue escalating. We are, of course, going to be talking about escalations as well in the Middle East with some new footage coming out uh, from what might be going on over in Gaza. Oh, okay. um, we hear that the West Bank, there's been a terrorist incursion at the West Bank. And, yeah, um, I mean... There's, there's People are talking about, oh, this conflict is now spreading to the West Bank. Well, I think that's almost an old story. Yeah. I've, I've been seeing a lot of uh, disruption in the West Bank. I think it's always of, inevitable. A couple of weeks, couple yeah, of weeks. People being and and of course it will, it just well. will. Uh, this is an escalating conflict, which once again... Uh, makes me question everyone and go, oh, ceasefire, ceasefire. We're not getting a ceasefire, it's getting worse. Yeah, and anyone, I, I mean, look, my position's quite clear, it's dreadful when any citizens are caught in the middle of anything, but there are mm. two people in this uh, war, and I suppose people want to down tools. And frankly, one definitely wants the other one wiped off the face of the earth, and mm. the other one can't exist unless the other one has been wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I don't think this is Mrs. Miggins' bridge party discussing at, you know, the annual, annual general meeting who's going to make the sandwiches at next year's Christmas party. It's not that, no, I don't the think The idea it is of negotiating that. No. a ceasefire between these two is for the birds. Yeah, our man Douglas Murray uh, is out there and he's been into Gaza and we'll show you some of his report. 
which is astonishing stuff. Uh, yeah, never forget that as we talk about Keir Starmer and ceasefires and Labour MPs quitting and all, and all this stuff, uh, you kind of forget that this is all emanating from this terrible conflict in the middle of Gaza right now. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, we were discussing earlier with Trevor Kavanaugh how it's sort of geopolitical wheels within wheels as well, that Iran might have stoked the fury at the beginning, not liking the fact that Israel was cozying up to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, not really best mates of Iran, those countries. Yeah, um, and now things are escalating. They're scuttling off back yeah. into the corner. Rather yeah, than Iran and Hezbollah are sort of basically saying to Hamas, say, yeah, well you, well, you know, we've backed you all the way. Well, we've had to think about this. Well, yeah, a, not so sure uh, maybe you're on your own here. <laughs> Which, to me, suggests that Israel's strategy of fire and fury might actually be working. And one has to ask, if you don't go in hard and if you don't try and wipe out the terrorists in the early stages, then perhaps the end effect is prolonging it for even longer and continuing to put civilians' lives at risk both in Israel and in Palestine. Absolutely. Unless you get rid of the bad guys, you're not going to sort out the problem, surely. Very good point. Well, we want to know what you think. We're asking, is Sir Keir Starmer right to stick to his guns on the issue of a ceasefire? We'd love to hear from you, so do call us. 03444991000 is the number. If you want to be patched through to the studio, or if you're feeling a little bit more coy, you can text us. 8722 is the number for that. Or even tweet us on X. At Talk TV is the handle. Well, let's get back to our top story now, which is the fact that Sir Keir Starmer has faced a major rebellion last night after 56 Labour MPs voted for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Ten front benchers, including Jess Phillips, Afzal Khan, Yasmin Qureshi, even quit their roles in order to back the SNP motion. And there are fears that the rebellion could spread even further and uh, the damage uh, to the party's election hopes could be extensive. A uh, Savanta poll published today suggested almost half of Muslim Labour supporters from 2019 said that Starmer's handling of the Middle East conflict made them feel more negatively towards the party. Well, with us in the studio now is The Times' chief political correspondent, Aubrey Allegretti. I mean, let's look at this through the prism of politics and whether Sir Keir Starmer is taking a risk here, knowing that there are various communities and a significant proportion of Labour voters who would be very sympathetic to the idea of a ceasefire, let alone some people sitting on the green benches, and yet he's sticking to his guns. He is. I mean, it's been a really rocky 24 hours to, for Labour. I have spoken to MPs who voted for the SNP motion for a ceasefire and those who wanted to but decided not to, they both say that they barely slept all night. They've been crying, they're worried about their safety, their family's safety. This is not an issue to be taken lightly at all. However, politically speaking, Keir Starmer's team, I think, today are feeling that he was right in showing leadership, in sort of forcing them to either stick to the Labour position or resign. Over the last four weeks, we've had this sort of slightly wishy-washy position where Keir Starmer's position has been relatively clear, but there have been shadow ministers basically given free reign to speak out and say what they liked without having to compromise their jobs. That now has come to an end. Uh, can I just pick up on what you just said there? Sorry, sorry Kevin. Right. When you were saying that there are MPs who are worried for their personal safety and the safety of their families, can you tell me a bit more about that? Because that's quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the case for MPs on both sides. They know that tensions and emotions are incredibly high and there's no reason to suggest that they're well-founded fears, but as an MP, you're always scared for your safety. And I've just spoken to some of those today on both sides. Who, who do worry about what happens next. Um, we're always hearing that the Muslim vote is crucial to Labour's uh, success. Uh, I mean, is it? Uh, has uh, Keir Starmer here concluded that I can lose uh, a lot of Muslim support and still win the next election? In the end, as I said earlier, you know, let's face it, politics is a mathematics game. Uh, is that the case, do you think? It's quite hard to tell because when you're sort of mapping things like census data and voting intention and surveying people, it's hard to directly kind of draw a line between people's support before the policy and people's support afterwards, what religion they are and things like that. However, obviously, you can trace the fact that a lot of the MPs who voted for the ceasefire yesterday do represent seats with large Muslim populations and probably feel that they were doing so to vote for a ceasefire in order to support their own seat. I spoke to a shadow cabinet minister who said they've received a thousand emails in 24 hours about the subject. So it's something that people have been very vocal about and MPs understand that. 
I think the older MPs who've been around for a long time are a little bit more resilient. They talked about going through, for example, the 2013 vote on airstrikes in Syria and how that was a really tough decision for the Labour Party to have to make how it was going to vote. Mm -hmm. But they felt that they'd sort of weathered it, understood it, done what they felt was right for the country, even though there was immense pressure on a really big foreign policy issue from their constituents. And some of the newer MPs who haven't been exposed to those kind of situations before, this is the first time they've been confronted with it. And they're the ones who are a little bit more nervous about how they react to their constituents. I mean, the last time Labour had a massive majority, the Blairs, followed by Gordon Brown, was a time when the UK was interventionist in the Middle East. Do you think we're now seeing a Labour Party under Starmer who is not afraid to do that, not afraid to stand up on the world stage and make decisions that might be unpopular with various communities, but that he might perceive in the UK and the West's interests? I think that's true to a, a certain extent, insofar as Keir Starmer doesn't want to do anything that kind of causes a rift between the main two political parties in the UK. He wants world leaders to know that if he gets elected Prime Minister next year, yeah. that he is somebody that they can trust. Yeah. He can be brought into a room, they can do a deal, they can try and get round the table and ultimately gets the best possible situation. He doesn't think it's helpful to sort of be on the outside pressuring other countries or indeed the UK government from his position in opposition. So in this instance, do you think he has calculated that it is more important to him to be seen as prime ministerial, uh, to be seen as an international global figure of strength than it is to, to appease the Muslim community. That is his calculation. Yeah, I think he's taken the calculation that he wants to appear as prime ministerial as possible, and sometimes that means doing unpopular things, things that might be unpopular with certain communities mm -hmm. or religious groups. That's, I think, the intent about what's gone and on. The blue over the last wall. Weeks. I mean, we were saying earlier that uh, Rishi Sunak appears to have given up on the red wall, but the blue wall, if you like, will be important to Starmer, and uh, his strong stance on the ceasefire or no ceasefire will appeal to the blue wall, right? It should do, yes. Um, I think it's certainly true that Keir Starmer is trying to reach into those places where the, the sort of Tory, Lib Dem and Labour, not even marginals, really, mm. the home counties, the places where people have abandoned the Conservatives. Uh, it's notable, of course, that of the 10 Labour MPs who've entered Parliament since the last election, i.e. through by-elections, they all stood up and backed Keir Starmer. So they seem to be behind him as well. Interesting. Uh, it's uh, what's going on with the SNP though. I mean, we know that Hamza Yousaf has a very sort of you know personal connection to what's going on. His relatives were stuck. His wife's parents, I believe, were stuck in Gaza at the uh, outset of this war. Now safely returned home. I think we can all be glad about that. But it's his position, his extremely vocal position against Israel, frankly, um, uh, striking a chord with people in Scotland. I think we've seen that where you have kind of devolved and regional leaders, there is support for that position. It's not just about Scotland and Hamza Youssef. You've seen Sadiq Khan advocate for it in London, Andy Burnham advocate for it in Greater Manchester. So it's not a sort of Scotland-specific issue. Where I think there is frustration with the Scottish National Party is there are some, particularly in Labour, who claim that the amendment was a stunt. And the result of it has been actually to show that the UK Parliament does not support a ceasefire and has therefore weakened the position of advocating for one. Yeah, I mean, I'm just hearing, actually, that uh, students have been marching on the home of Rishanara Ali after she didn't vote for that ceasefire, which uh, really backs up what you're saying about MPs actually being quite worried, particularly perhaps if they represent certain communities, about a backlash uh, and what danger that might pose to them and their families. We have, of course, seen uh, two um, fatal, horrible attacks on MPs uh, in recent years. Um, I mean, is there a, a real risk do you think that things could escalate and that that you know special measures might need to be put in place for certain MPs if things do get more tense? So I've seen the reports that there are apparently uh, students who are marching towards Roshanara Ali's office in um, I'm not sure where it is but uh, yeah so there are clearly people who want to keep the pressure on this issue they don't see yesterday's vote as the sort of end of this issue if a Labour MP uh, abstained on the issue of a ceasefire, they will definitely come under pressure continuously from campaigners who want that position to change. And indeed, some of the Labour MPs who have had to step down said the dialogue isn't going to stop. We're still going to try and convince the Labour leadership that this is will be the eventual position. It's just a question of kind of timing. 
In terms of the level of sort of protest and whether or not anything turns nasty, I was speaking to Sir Mark Rowley, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner today, who was stressing that really the police want to de-escalate as much as possible and MPs are always concerned with threats to their safety. We haven't seen anything yet to suggest that that is well founded or that anything is going to get worse, but they are certainly worried about it. Mm. Uh, so, uh, Starmer, I thought yesterday in PMQs, was quite sort of um, restrained. Uh, and you would have thought it would have been the day of his life, his day of his political life because of the trouble Rishi was in. So, this storm over the ceasefire vote uh, is the last thing he wanted. At a time when he should be riding high, he's losing support in the polls. Uh, he, he must be pretty damn fed up right now. Well, I think, broadly speaking, Labour feel as though this week in general has sort of gone quite well for them. While there was the economic news, which helps the Conservatives suggesting that inflation had been halved within Rishi Sunak's target, the Supreme Court judgment obviously threw a huge spanner in the works and kind of knocks the government's good news uh, out of the headlines. When it comes to Keir Starmer's position, I think he will feel emboldened by the fact that he can say... I am taking strong action against people in my party. I can't necessarily control all of these MPs, but I can control whether or not they're in the shadow cabinet, on the shadow ministerial ladder, and therefore, if what they say represents our view, I've been strong and decisive. That'll be his argument. Yeah. And I suspect so far it looks as though it's working. You haven't seen any kind of big swing in the polls. This has been an issue for Labour, not just for the last 24 hours or a week, yeah. for the last four weeks. Yes, it has, yeah. So right. we haven't seen any yeah. kind of big swings in the national polling yet to suggest this is a big problem for him nationally. Uh, Aubrey, stay where you are, if you don't mind. Uh, we're going to go over now. Joining us now is Tony Blair's former political secretary, John McTiernan. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Uh, we're just talking to Aubrey Allegretti from The Times here about, uh, you know, this should have been a great moment for Keir Starmer as the Tory party... Uh, sort of unravels and self-destructs, uh, but he's got his own uh, domestic problems. Uh, just how much of a problem do you think he does have after this rebellion against his strong stance on the ceasefire? Uh, is his strong stance a good thing for him in the end, or uh, is he facing big problems at a time when he should be really celebrating uh, Rishi's problems? Well, he's, he's not got big problems. He, the, the, the poll this morning in the mirror has a 27% lead for Labour. Um, Keir looked last night, he's looked this, this week, like a future Prime Minister. Future Prime Ministers have to say things that's right to say on the global stage, and that's what, he, that's what he's done. Um, he, he, he regrets, I regret, the loss of some of his front benches, particularly Jess Phillips. But in the end, uh, there are going to be things that Prime Minister Starmer does that not everybody agrees with in the, in, the, in the Labour Party. But there's no disagreement, I think, fundamentally. I mean, as someone who worked closely with Tony Blair, and, of course, Blair was the interventionist when it came to uh, Middle Eastern foreign policy, certainly in the UK, uh, how hard is it for a party like the Labour Party to take people with them on these big geopolitical decisions? I think we might have lost him, unfortunately. Shall that... I answer that? It's really <laughs> hard. It's really hard. Well, Aubrey, you well, Aubrey, it. Yeah, you, you try and do a John McTurnan and uh, you see how, how hard you think it is for the Labour Party. <laughs> and what, what, what might what might Sakir Starmer be thinking right now of what he can do to take his people with him? I won't attempt to do the accent to impress <laughs> John. But, um... I'll go on, I'll go on. <laughs> I think in terms of where we go from here... Um, Labour has shown that it can be slightly flexible in its sort of response to this crisis. It is changing, it is unfolding. We're not in the same place now as we were on October the 7th, obviously because of Israel's retaliation and there's debates about the rights or wrongs of that. Where I think Keir Starmer will be able to show his strength is in how flexible he can be. If the situation changes, does his approach change? That's where I think most people will be looking to see whether or not he's reactive and responsive and not kind of sticking to this uh, kind of strict line. Obviously, it may be that things change in the Middle East, but so long as he can sort of work hand in hand with the UK Prime Minister and show that he's aligned with what the US is asking for, I think it will continue to sort of bode well for him in terms of the opinion polls. That's what we're seeing. So in the end, uh, you know, counterintuitively, this is... 
quite a good situation <laughs> for him because uh, for everything he might lose here, perhaps uh, some Muslim support, uh, he's making a name for himself as someone who could be prime minister, as someone who is uh, prepared to make the difficult decisions. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Keir Starmer doesn't want to lose any voters, but he probably thinks that this is not just the right thing to do electorally, but also the right thing to do morally. Uh, Labour insiders, I think, worry that they haven't communicated Labour's message strong enough. They sort of fear as though they're kind of being, being buffeted by how other people are categorising and defining Labour's own stance on this. And I think they'd like to see Keir Starmer out and about more talking about it. We saw that speech from him a couple of weeks ago, one of his only sort of real interventions in the debate outside of the Commons. I think there are some Labour insiders that would like to see more of that. I think David lammy has been uncharacteristically quiet as well, considering he's a, the, the shadow foreign secretary. He doesn't seem to be sticking his head above don't the Don't complain, he all. might start talking. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. Right, some of your texts now, because we were asking you whether you think Sakia Starmer was right to stick to his guns when it comes to the issue of a ceasefire. Alex says, not yes, me. he was. That's not her. Alex says, yes, he was. Thankfully, Israel would not pay any attention to it, even if it went through. Nick writes, yes, he's probably only doing so as he is desperate to win the next election. Well, that would be true. But at least he's doing the right thing and using his brain. But Alvin says he's incapable of sticking to his guns on anything. Well, time will tell. And Aussies tweeted, no, it's none of his business for a start. Second, you can't negotiate with terrorists, period. Uh, we have Robert from Sunderland on the line. Hi, Robert. Morning. Oh, sorry, afternoon. Not afternoon. quite morning, but uh, uh, bad yeah, start, but off you go. Life, what would enough. you like to say? Right, a um, little bit about what Aubrey just said just now. He's right. They need to get out and they need to talk to people. My local MP voted um, for the ceasefire last night's vote, yet she has never been out and talked to her um, constituents about anything over this last few weeks since uh, October 7th. And it is wrong. These people are working for us, and I feel that they should represent all of their constituents, not just little groups of them, but all of their constituents. And if that means talking to different um, groups, ethnic groups, religious groups, whatever, then that is what they need to do. They cannot... If, it, if Jess Phillips feels that she had to step down because of the Muslims um, in her community, um, she felt she had to back them, what about something that happens in the future when the Christians feel they need some support. Is she going to do the same for them? Well, it depends uh, how many of them there are. They usually go with the majority, so, uh, yes. Yeah but, it, yeah, but they're there to represent everybody. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, in theory. Uh, but yeah. uh, <laughs> in theory. Politics, <laughs> politics is a dirty game. Uh, great really call. Is. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going back now. Uh, we've got the line back up. Uh, we're going back to Tony Blair's former political secretary, John McTiernan. Uh, John, sorry we lost you there. We haven't got long now. Uh, but uh, this conflict is going to go yeah. drag on and on and on. We know that. Uh, will it become an escalating problem for Keir Starmer if the cries for a ceasefire reach crescendo level? Uh, I mean, they're getting that way already. Uh, and he still doesn't call for a ceasefire as more and more people die out there. So, no, I don't believe so. Um, I think the, it's clear what the Americans are putting pressure on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli government. Uh, it's clear that Labour agree with Secretary of State Blinken uh, that too many Palestinians have been killed. It's time for an extended humanitarian pause. You can't have a ceasefire because it, it, a ceasefire requires two sides. If Hamas released the hostages, they would show they were willing to have a ceasefire. But as we've seen in Northern Ireland, the terrorists have to agree to a ceasefire, as well as the government. And at the moment, Hamas have no intention of a ceasefire. So a ceasefire is not the way to end the conflict, end the fighting. The way to end the fighting is to actually have a humanitarian pause, to actually do the work internationally on the two-state solution and move towards a situation where the, the hostages are either released or can be rescued. And I think this issue will continue as long as the conflict is there. Keir's clear we need a two-state solution. He's also clear um, we also need in the UK an NHS that works. And that matters for every constituency, everybody in every constituency, as your, as your previous call was talking about. Everyone needs our country to be fixed. 
and getting a Labour government is the first step to that. And I think that's the thing that unites everybody who resigned yesterday. They've gone to the back benches fighting for a Keir Starmer government. I mean, as a man who worked closely with Tony Blair, and Blair, you know, has gone down in history as someone who was interventionist when it came to things in the Middle East, how difficult is it going to be for Sir Keir Starmer to bring the whole Labour Party with him? I mean, from your memory and recollections of what it was like in the Blair years, I mean, how tough is that? Well, we won an election after intervening in Iraq. Um, after putting British troops on the ground in Iraq. Um, there are no British troops involved in this conflict. There will be no British troops involved in this conflict. This isn't uh, an intervention. This is, you know, people on either side, whether they're for a ceasefire or whether they're for humanitarian pause, they're actually commentating on this conflict. We're not participants. The only people who can influence uh, this are probably Qatar over Hamas uh, and, the United and the United States over, uh, over Israel. Everybody else is basically commentating. And I think that's the point Keir is trying to make. If I'm prime minister, when I'm prime minister, I will have to say things on the world stage which are credible. And just standing on the world stage and saying you wish things were different, wish things were better, is not a way to actually get things done. I completely understand from the bottom of my heart why people want to ceasefire desperately and want it now. The problem is we live in, we're living in a situation where Israel was attacked with such a violent act of terrorism, such a destructive act of terrorism, um, and there's still so many hundreds of hostages being held, um, that in that situation, every every progressive prime minister across, across the country, you know, Australian Labour Party prime minister, Norwegian Labour Party prime minister, the socialist prime minister uh, in Spain, all have the same position as, as Kier, which is extend the humanitarian pause, lift the siege, supply the hospitals, but keep the pressure on Hamas to release the hostages. John, thank you so thank much. You, John. Yeah, point well made. Uh, we are, at the end of the day, just commentators in all of this. We certainly are. Well, coming up after the break, the IDF drop evacuates flyers on southern Gaza during a tactical four-hour pause in fighting today. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, Israeli forces have killed suspected Palestinian terrorists who are believed to have opened fire on a checkpoint in the West Bank. It's as an Gaza evacuate leaflets have been dropped in southern Gaza as the IDF announces a tactical four-hour pause in fighting. Meanwhile, Israeli troops have released photos they claim show weapons found by troops during their ground operations in Gaza. It uh, comes as fighter jets reportedly struck the home of a senior Hamas leader and the Israeli president warned a very strong force may need to stay in the territory. Right, well, joining us now is Anthony Glees, director of the Centre for Security and Intelligence Studies. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. So much to talk about here. First of all, let's have a start off with the intelligence. I mean, everyone's been saying to Israel, OK, you've uh, gone inside hospitals, proved to us that that was necessary. Uh, has Israel been able to do that? Well, not really, not to everybody's satisfaction. I mean, the, the, the truth is that this, this war has been going badly for Israel for some time, and it's going beginning to go very badly indeed. They're losing the media war, the propaganda war, if you prefer, which is amazing given uh, the awful attack by Hamas terrorists on the 7th of October, the fact that over 200 hostages are still being held by Hamas. Nevertheless, uh, what it looks like is that the Israelis are killing lots of civilians, um, 1,200, uh, 12,000, that kind of figure, but very few Hamas fighters. We're told that 75% of the people killed are women and children. Now, no way of verifying that, but it's probably true, given the way uh, the Israelis are bombarding and bombing Gaza. But the fact is only 25% of these people are males suggests the males are somewhere and the Israelis aren't getting to them. So the evidence they've produced from the hospital is scant in the extreme, uh, there's no clear sign that the intelligence failure that precipitated this war in, in the first place is, is being addressed. In other words, we still can't be confident that Israeli intelligence is actually telling the Israeli Defense Force where to fight. We're told that the Israelis have dropped leaflets in the south of Gaza telling people to, to get out of the way. That is also ridiculous because they just told people in the north of Gaza to go to the south to get out of the way. So, yes, they can do stunts in the sense of bombing, these huge bombs that can uh, take out 20 foot worth of concrete, uh, 100 feet of earth. Yeah, that looks, looks great. Maybe they get a, a few commander. They say they've got the chief of Hamas there. But actually winning the war that they're not doing. And when it comes to fighting in these tunnels, that's man-to-man -man fighting. All the bombs in the world aren't going to enable the Israelis to have a victory. And meanwhile, international public opinion is turning against them big time. That's really, really problematical. Um, and Anthony, given that uh, Hamas don't want a ceasefire either, and Israel's position is quite clear, you know, unless you release all of the hostages. We won't even talk to you. I mean, in the real world, is there a snowball's chance in hell of a ceasefire in this awful conflict anytime soon? I don't think there's uh, any chance of a real ceasefire, no, for the reasons that you give. However, unless the Israelis can have a substantial breakthrough, unless they can win the war for public opinion, which I say I think they're losing and lost, uh, then the pressure on Netanyahu, who I think is a crackpot, to be perfectly honest, he rushed into this after the massive intelligence failure that caused Israel the most damage ever. Um, he rushed into this uh, revenge attack using ridiculous rhetoric, talking about animals and turning people into rubble. And now uh, there is no proof, no firm proof, that there are these Hamas centers under the hospital. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea that they should be there, but why aren't we seeing them if they're there? And the little, you know, the arms caches they found, they would be consistent with armed guards in, in the hospital 
in any case, the lack of male corpses, awful thing to say, but that is in itself significant. So when you add all these things together, you are drawn to the conclusion that it may well be in Israel's interest to have a humanitarian pause that turns into a ceasefire. And again, think about what Israel said, no ceasefire without having the hostages back. But you can have the hostages back and leave Hamas intact. If your aim is to destroy Hamas, then you've got to destroy Hamas, not worry about the hostages. So, you know, it's a huge muddle. And there are many voices in Israel now saying uh, Netanyahu has got to go. He's in no fit condition to conduct this rushed, precipitate campaign. And I, I, I think that, it, it, you know, we're, we're moving to a stage now. No ceasefire, as you say, can't be a ceasefire. Those uh, Labour MPs are just, it's a knee-jerk response to their Muslim voters. And, and, and it is, is, is deplorable in a way. Of course, we all want the fighting to stop. There's no question about that. We all want the killing of civilians to stop. But a ceasefire isn't the way to do it. A humanitarian pause might do it. And you know, there are many instances in history where ceasefires have gone on for years and years and years. So uh, a humanitarian pause, which ultimately might lead to a ceasefire when the hostages are returned, that could be one way of ending the carnage. Uh, I want to ask you about Iran in all of this, because uh, when those atrocities took place on the 7th of October, there was a lot of conjecture that uh, Iran was potentially behind it, helping Hamas to coordinate it, at the very least egging them on. Um, and uh, a lot of UK intelligence reports suggesting that Iran at least has some hands to play in this info war that's going on surrounding, as you were saying, uh, you know, the propaganda, essentially, that Israel is losing. And yet today, we've just heard from Ayatollah Ali Khamenei that uh, Iran didn't know the 7th of October attacks were going to happen and don't want to get involved. What do you make of all of this? Well, I wouldn't believe a word any <laughs> Iranian official said, even if I asked him for the time of day. Uh, I don't think anybody serious doubts that uh, Iran has trained and funded Hamas fighters over many years. And I don't think anybody doubts that the weapons that have found their way into Gaza, despite the blockade by Israel, is another you know, very inefficient thing because people say, oh, Gaza was occupied by the Israelis. Well, actually, it wasn't occupied. That was the problem, that it wasn't occupied. And as for the blockade, it didn't work very well. We've seen all these tunnels uh, that could take stuff in. So I don't think there's any doubt. But you are right that... Uh, Iran and other, and Hezbollah, its revolutionary army up in the north, uh, have not intervened. And that's very big. I mean, people like me did think that there was a real chance that there would be a much more general war, a regional war, and then a more general war, a, a chance that this would happen if Israel won a kind of knockout victory. Well, it hasn't won th that knockout victory so far after about a month of fighting. And the other thing to note is that President Biden and above all, Anthony Blinken seem to have kept people out of it, which is excellent. And as far as Iran is concerned, of course, they don't yet have nuclear weapons and Israel does. And I suspect that also focuses the minds mm. of the Ayatollahs uh, on internal <laughs> repression, but not having a war. Quite. Yes, it certainly does. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony Gleese. Uh, we have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime. We asked, is Sakir Starmer right to stick to his guns on the issue of a ceasefire? Now, Gillian says, yes, ceasefire is not a viable option. It would leave the door wide open for Hamas to attack again. Helen has tweeted, yes, you have to stick to your principles, even if it annoys people. It's a hard decision, but he's made it. Gino says, gesture politics here have absolutely no influence on the conflict. It was a waste of time and energy. If you want a ceasefire, it's the US or Israel you need to focus on. But Cameron writes, uh, well, I assume not David Cameron from Kiev, <laughs> uh, Israel's business is their own, but that doesn't mean they should be allowed to commit war crimes with impunity. They have every right to defend themselves, but that doesn't include turning a neighbouring country into rubble. Not technically a country, uh, but uh, Jackie in Manchester is on the line. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Alex. Hello. What would you like to say? 
I would like to say that, yes, I do think his stance is right, but I fear for how long it will last. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I think it throws a, a lot of red flags up um, when a quarter of his MPs revolt against um, the three-line whip and when he's got unions that are coming out on the protest marches um, and also blocking munitions factories that are sending weapons to Israel, I think he's going to have instability in his party. And despite him telling us for months how united they were and how he purged the party, I think that underneath it all, uh, there's a lot more going on. Uh, well, United Labour is not. Thanks very much, Jackie. Oh, coming up after the break, is the Royal Rift perhaps mending? There are reports Harry and Charles had a warm telephone conversation for the King's birthday. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Back wins? Place. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for this? You're like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying <laughs> this now. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, no, no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. Why? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, uh, there are rumours that the royal rift between Prince Harry and his father, the King, may be thawing after a supposedly warm phone call between the pair for Charles's 75th birthday. Yeah, but that says Omid Scobie has claimed that Prince William ignored Harry's phone calls on the day of the Queen's death as the Duke of Sussex raced to be by her side. But should we believe anything that man says? Meanwhile, Netflix have released several episodes of the sixth and final series of The Crown. 
Here's a glimpse. Even though we weren't brilliant at being married, can we, um... Can we be brilliant at all this? I think so. And not just for them, but for us too. She didn't get to keep the man of her dreams, but the friend of her dreams. I mean, it's much more than a friend. What a touching moment. Now, here yeah. to help us separate fact from fiction, a lot of fiction in The Crown, by the way, <laughs> is Sarah Hewson, Talk TV's excellent royal editor. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Well, that kind of sums it up, really. I don't imagine that scene ever happened, do you? Well, we do believe that, actually, after the very, very difficult days in the War of the Wales is that have been played out in the media, in the time leading up to Diana's death, actually, there had been a bit of a thawing, yeah. talking about thawing of relations within the royal family, but a thawing of relations between her and Charles. And obviously, this is a fictionalised scene. No one knows the context of the conversations, but there might be a degree of truth in that. Um, I think what that shows us, though, is how this uh, season of The Crown is portraying Prince Charles, as he was then, mm. in a pretty sympathetic light. He is cast as a sympathetic character in this, trying to have a relationship with his ex-wife, trying to do the best by his sons, and trying to persuade the Queen, after Diana's death, that she needed to respond to the calls of the nation uh, to stand up and be seen. And what about other members of the royal family? Is, is it no. as quite kind to them as it is perhaps to Charles? No, um, I don't think it is, and particularly the portrayal by Amanda, Imelda Staunton of the Queen. Look, she's a brilliant actress. Of course. Um, but um, we have seen over previous uh, series this very... this harder version of the Queen compared to the original Claire Foy, who I think when you watched her, you, you know, you forgot you were watching an actress mm. uh, portraying her. But as we've got closer to the current day, Imelda Staunton's version of the Queen, Queen is very devoid of emotion, pinched lips, she's, she's quite hard. And uh, they really go to town on this, her reluctance to be seen, mm. to come out, to, so to do that to, speech to on the morning, Buckingham Palace yeah. balcony, for example. Yeah, and uh, Olivia Colman's portrayal uh, p p portrayed as a sort of virtual Harrodan, that oh, ridiculous awful. scene of making Margaret Thatcher walk across the moors and the hills uh, by Balmoral in her sort of Sunday best. Absolute nonsense. We're losing the humour. We know that the Queen had a really good sense yeah. of humour and yeah, a twinkle, quite, yeah. and I feel that that's really missing. And I know these are difficult times, the death of Diana, but but even the warmth with her grandsons, William yeah. and Harry, I didn't see that yeah. in this. No, lots, cool. of fiction, lots of fiction uh, in The Crown, but the fact of the matter right now is Obi Scobie. What is it? What did you say? Omid Scobie. No, Covid Scabies. Covid Scabies. New book is out uh, called Endgame. And uh, in it, uh, there's a lot of disconcertion about the fact that uh, people feel this book is delving into a very private moment, you know, the, the weeks and the days leading up to the Queen's death. But also we're hearing that William is furious that this book says that when Harry, uh, trying to get to Bar Moral to, uh, in time for the Queen's passing, was desperately trying to phone William and William wouldn't take his calls. William is apparently furious and says this is a lie. So this book, Endgame, by Amos Scobie, due out on the 28th of November, but there's been an excerpt of it published on the US website, People, and in it, it talks about the day of the Queen's death and that once Harry had been informed by his father that the Queen was in her final hours, he, according to Omid Scobie, was trying to get hold of his brother William to organise transport to get to Aberdeen and that he was met with radio silence, that William just did not respond. That led to several hours delay for Harry, according to this account, and that Harry then had to charter his own plane from Luton to Aberdeen, which we know uh, happened. And much of this Harry has talked about yeah, in spare. A lot of this so book doesn't seem that new, Not a lot of it, it is yeah. new, but we are hearing a little bit more yeah, about Harry's emotions. And a friend uh, of Harry's is quoted in the book uh, as saying that Harry was absolutely crushed because when he landed at Aberdeen, he learnt of the Queen's death by a BBC News alert.
on his phone and hadn't been told by members of his family. And the book claims that behind the scenes there was a tussle going on between the Sussex camp and Buckingham Palace about when to make the announcement about the Queen's death and that Buckingham Palace decided they could wait no longer and the announcement was made before Harry had been yeah. told. Look, we are getting one side of the story in this book. Um, we're not going to hear from the royal family. Yeah. No. It's, I think it's very, very unlikely that they will comment on this. I mean, uh, are we... Do you have any information, inside information, about this truth call that's supposed to have happened and whether relations might be thawing despite this awful book coming No, out? I think this is a really positive sign this week in terms of an olive branch, perhaps coming from California. Prince Harry uh, reportedly calling his father on his birthday, Meghan, we're also told, spoke to the king and a video message from Archie and Lilibet wishing their grandfather singing happy birthday uh, to him. That's nice. And <laughs> suggestion that another call has been scheduled. I mean, it, you know, it's a bizarre family when you have to schedule a call right, with yeah. your dad, isn't it? <laughs> uh, the king doesn't have a mobile phone. Yeah. So you do have to make an appointment. Why doesn't uh, he have call. a mobile I don't know. phone? <laughs> it's it's maybe life is three. easier without a mobile phone, Kevin. I don't know. Um, but potentially step in the right direction. I think what it does highlight, though, when you see the claims in this book laid out, and, and you know, we, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but we do know things are tough. Whether or not there's a thawing between the King and Harry, but it looks a very different picture between Harry and William. Yeah, it seems to be plenty of people who don't mind spilling the beans. Yeah, though, I think it's just a, sort of slight, a slight shame that just as relations seem to be thawing, this book has upset the yeah. apple card again. But yep. uh, sadly, it seems, that Sarah and Alex, we've come to the end of the show. I know. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us again, same time, same place, tomorrow. Up next is Ian Collins. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>